Now, obviously, symbols have different meanings to different people. But basically, there are some that are pretty reliable, indicating the strongest factor in your life. I have visited most parts of the Western world. I have had consultations with hundreds of people in this particular field. And I have been able to note from their dream diaries and from what they've said, the importance of dreams in their lives. And the first symbol that stands out as being common to the kind of people that present in the Western world is the symbol of the personality. It's something we live with every day. Particularly in the United States, more lately in Britain, certainly in Australia and South Africa, the symbol of the personality is the automobile. American women, as they often jokingly say, would rather be without their husbands than without their motor cars. Mainly because, of course, the towns are so far apart, the shopping centers are miles away, and without a car, they are absolutely miserable. And so the symbol of the automobile is a very important basic one in Western uh, terminology, symbol terminology. The car is your vehicle, is your physical body, plus your emotional nature, plus your mental capacity. It is your vehicle of consciousness. The driver of the vehicle. The driver of the vehicle must be regarded as the superego, or if you like, the infused, the soul-infused consciousness. So here you have, for most of us anyway, the two most important symbols identified by me, by others who know me, as being the most likely you're going to experience from day one. And day one represents the day you begin your spiritual diary records of your dreams. So how will it come to you in the most obvious way? You love your automobile because it gets you around. It enables you to achieve things in your life. And so it represents your personality. But if you are taking a path that alarms the psyche, if you are going down a road that seems to have taken you away from the freeway, I always quote this, I know it's naughty, but I'm going to say it again. Somebody said to me the other day, uh, this and that, um, about um, uh, the path. They were treading the path. And I said to myself, if you're on the path, I'm on the freeway. And it's true that many people don't understand what is implied by treading the path. And a life in using symbols, of using symbols, is important. And so if the, if the, the psyche is alarmed at the direction you're taking in your life, if it is, for instance, against the soul's purpose, 
and you must be sure of these things. You must be able to talk to people and say to them, Sweetie, why do you think you're on earth? Oh, usually they hadn't thought about it. Often they will say, I think I'm here to learn something. I think I'm here to serve mankind. If they, if they know this, that's good. But most often they don't know why they're here on earth. And another question you can ask is, if you came back into incarnation, what do you think you'd like to be? What would you like to reincarnate as? Again, it'll set them back. They're not sure. Sometimes they will say, I think I'd like to do the kind of work you do, or I'd like to be a healer and so on. And so in anything to do with dreams, you need to get a, a history of the person. History taking is fundamental to helping anybody. Some people give it easily, some people hate giving it. But in whatever way you choose, you must get a, a history of the individual. How will the dream talk to you on behalf of the psyche? It wants to make up for things that are not right. And so I've written up here compensation and complementation. If your personality is in the opinion of your psyche lopsided, it will want to compensate for that lopsidedness. If you are, as I pointed out to, for Richard the other day, who was selling the books, when Richard has a bad time in business and things are going wrong and the marriage and this and that, he has an extraordinary increase in dream life. And the dreams are vivid in color and meaningful. And it always happens when he's having a rough time as a personality. Now that's worth remembering that the psyche compensates for, compensates for. And it also has the ability to give complementation. And I'm going to try and illustrate those things here for the rest of the evening. First of all, I want to continue with this idea of the car, the automobile, being the symbol in your dream. You have a dream in which you're driving your car and you can't keep it on the road. It's wandering. There's something wrong with the steering wheel and the car wanders off the road and you awake usually not understanding why you've had such a dream. But when you record it in your diary, and you record events, especially spiritual events in your diary, simultaneously you will learn that that is a symbolic, a symbolic dream telling you you are diverging, you are losing your way, you are allowing your personality to get its way and you are losing the path. You may find that the car is stalling on a hill. You are running out of energy. You are practicing things that are demanding energy that you haven't got. You may find that you are hypothyroid. You might, may find some other endocrine gland is dysfunctioning and you're getting warnings. You're getting warnings from the, from the psyche that this is so. I have had 
my long experience of people, hundreds of examples of the automobile representing the personality and the ways in which it can be, it can be guided back into efficient, uh, as an efficient vehicle for the person. The other symbol of personality, and you're bound to get these, you're bound to get them. If you're beginning to regenerate your dream life, you will get these and you will remember me. You'll remember what I said. The other symbol, especially for women, is the symbol of the house. Your personality is the home of the soul. In this life, your personality is the home of the soul. Now, the soul may not like what it is dwelling in, and it may seek to tell you that. And so you may have a dream in which you're in a house and the windows are filthy. They need cleaning. The roof is leaking. The floorboards are creaking and twisting. There are things about your personality that gravely need attention. You're not alarmed because it's a house that you've, you've had in the dream, not you. It's the house that is, is in the dream. And so you're not alarmed and frantic about it. The soul has, the psyche, has wrapped it up in such a way that you can accept it. And then uh, when you are daydreaming, you can think about it and it comes back again to you. And you are being told, you are being compensated for, and you are having complementary experiences in dreams to make this difficulty obvious to you so that you'll do something about it. Then it gets down, once you've had that kind of overall dream, it gets down to specifics. You may find that uh, when you're trying to speak, say something, that your mouth has got a, a, a nasty taste in it. And that is an indication that some of the things you say, some of your communications are reprehensible. I always like to think of the psyche in terms of a balance terms of a balance. And if one of the pans is the psyche, you could write psyche on there, and then the other pan is the dream. And the whole mechanism is to compensate for overloading too much in some aspect, or underloading or personalities within your establishment that are clashing with each other. How you can strengthen one and take the viciousness out of another. And so dreams are meant to balance the output and the input of the psyche. To balance the output and the input of the psyche. Let me give you one or two examples, one in each of the two sexes. Let us say that the mother is a very famous person. Let us say that the mother is an Olympic athlete, and she is the, the focus of great attention. Uh, she gets accolades and, and goodness knows what. And the daughter, mother, and the daughter, the daughter is full of admiration. Energy follows thought. Her mother is the center of her world. And she helps the mother to maintain her image as an Olympic athlete. And the girl is pouring out her energy to her mother. 
and things begin to go wrong. She becomes anorexic. She begins to stop eating. <clears throat> she has a negative self-esteem. Doesn't think so much of herself when she has such a wonderful mother performing every day <coughs> and attracting attention. So the result is that <coughs> the girl is placed in a position in which she is strangling. It's a, it's a personality attrition. The flow of, of metabolism, <coughs> psychic energy, joy, wisdom, love, <coughs> all these things Got a little bit of coconut from that biscuit somebody gave me. <coughs> and so uh, she is being strangled and she needs to compensate. And so the dream life of the girl will be one in which she is tempted with food. She has dream experiences which improve her own self-esteem and she is drawn out of her anorectic condition. And that is a very common occurrence today, especially where uh, television personalities are concerned. If you're talking about the male, it may be similar, but under a, a different circumstance. You all know that you all know that a boy growing up in the shadow of his father is taught to emulate the father. It's called the apprenticeship complex. Oh, I want to be an engine, I want to be a train driver. Because the father is a train driver, he wants to be a train driver and Mama uh, gets him a, a train driver's suit or something and a little chook-chook to play with, and, and so the thing grows on the boy to be like his father. The psyche doesn't like this too much. Uh, while the child is young, of course, very helpful, very compensating and so on. But when the boy is now uh, ready to go to college, ready to to choose a career. It may be that there is some quality there in the boy that needs to be developed in a completely different field from what the father has fed to him as in the apprenticeship complex. And so the, uh, the psyche will set out, will set out to, to, to compensate and to complementate uh, this problem. And you will have, like this boy, you will have somebody come to you and say, I have terrible dreams about my father. I love my father. My father has been so good to me all my life, but I have these awful dreams about him in which he thrashes me for, for something I haven't done, and he, he does this and he does that. And the reason for even the father dying, the reason for it would be that the psyche is trying to compensate and put him off somewhat, put him off the apprenticeship complex. Stop following your daddy. You're a bigger person, a bigger personality than your father. But doesn't say to the boy outright, you mustn't follow your father anymore, he's no good for you. That would be hurtful to the personality. And so symbols are used. And the boy is, is now being fed with dreams that will make him, that will undermine, that will be negative. You've got to face these things in psychology. Psychology is not a bed of roses. Psychology is, is something which exposes the 
causality and the truth behind people's behavior and, and it needs to expose these things in order to, to deal with them. And so that's what we mean by uh, compensation and complementation. As we have had in the world of psychology recently, the activities of David Bain, is it? David Bain, the man who got up in a glass case and uh, starved for 42 days. It's worth looking at the subject of anorectics. Anorectics. It's a vastly interesting subject in uh, present times because terrorism is often associated with confinement. You confine your terrorists. We all remember Irish terrorists being uh, confined, what, 20 years ago during Mrs. Thatcher's uh, uh, tenancy. And they undertook starvation. They, they stopped eating and uh, had to be dealt with accordingly. I think two or three of them died and uh, the whole subject of anorexia with Princess Diana uh, is, is, is quite a, a frequent one today in the field of psychology. I had an occasion recently to fast and I fasted for six weeks as it happens almost the same period as David Bain not so strenuously perhaps, not so uh, obvious and showman-like, uh, but I did. And um, Sorrel here knows that this, this is, is true. And in 42 uh, days, I lost five stone. And I found out certain things which the esoteric world has been under a misapprehension about with regard to fasting. When I grew up in theosophy, I understood that it was good to go out and fast like they used to in the old days, go out into the desert and uh, eat nothing for, for many, many days. And during this period, they would have spiritual experiences and that the nature of the dream life would be often completely changed. I did not find that. I would, as a doctor of medicine, I would oppose any suggestion that people should relentlessly fast on and on in the hope that they would have spiritual growth and that they would get rid of so many impurities that their lives would be changed forever. I would oppose it. Not that I believe that fasting, that regulating the diet isn't important. I do believe that. I believe we should tread, tread the middle path. Let me tell you some of the things that I noticed. I found that at the height of the fast, there was incredible changes in the sensory capacities. The smell that would come. I was in a good hotel, a first class hotel. The smells that emerged from things that were previously quite innocent to the sense of olfaction. The, uh, there were things coming up of, out of the pipes in the, in the bathroom, uh, never mind anywhere else, that you, you had not noticed when you were uh, not fasting. Terrible smell. You could smell what people had eaten for dinner. Uh, in, in an offensive way. I mean, nice people 
uh, friends. You, you couldn't bear to have them near you because of the smell they were giving off. Now, I record that not because I'm, I, I have anything I want to uh, preach about, I'm merely recording it for the sake of, of research. And you could smell the kitchens, even though it was normally not noticeable. You began to feel that you could smell the kitchens and what they were going to be serving up at dinner that night. I noticed what I think I said the other night, and that is that some people, like myself, who have had slight thyroid difficulties way back in the past, mainly through living up country, away from the seaside, I found that when I ate onions, that the smell discharged itself in the whole region of the neck. Came out with, the, with the, the sweating from the neck and nowhere else. It was uh, an extraordinary thing. And having a great love of onions, not garlic, but onions, uh, I, I noted this uh, uh, and also the capacity for it to affect all throat chakra qualities. Throat chakra qualities. We can talk about that if you're interested. I found that appetite, which was strong and keen for the first week, just disappeared. You just did not want to eat. If you first put your mind to it, if you made a resolve that you were not going to eat, that the appetite through compensation and complementation and so on, uh, just shut down. It was an extraordinary thing. It was being a doctor and knowing a bit about anatomy, I couldn't help feeling there was a part of the surface of the brain that was just not interested in eating after a, a period. I have a note here that there was no gain in psychic experience or mysticism uh, through fasting as far as I could detect. You became susceptible to the A vitaminoses which means that because you were fasting, you were not getting your adequate vitamins, and so you were susceptible to all kinds of infections, especially things like fungal infection. And there were other things. With the weight loss, I dropped from 280 pounds to 210. With the weight loss, certain factors emerged that showed up defects in the body. I had a piece of shrapnel through my chest, in there and out there, which dislodged, shattered some of the ribs. When I lost that weight, I found that lifting anything would pull bones out of apposition where they were fitting quite nicely into their uh, spaces, they were tended to be pulled out. It was only when I put back some of the weight that they slid back to their correct positions and were padded adequately. And so one of, when I write an article on it, one of the pieces of advice I would, I would give is, be sure that when you fast, you don't put your skeleton to, under such strain as to dislodge things like clavicles and ribs from their, from their cartilages and uh, their, their sockets and so on. Of course you get rid of toxins. Uh, the filthiest things that you can think of 
come out of you because they can't stay there. It was interesting to watch how sweat follicles that were fat and uh, all right, healthy, uh, discharged and eventually with strong fasting uh, were, were denied the oils and things that are normally found. If you had an oil, oily skin, the skin dried out and the follicles closed down. Very interesting, I thought that. The, as I've got here, follicles emptied. If you had a pimple anywhere, the pimple could not come to, come to uh, eruption. Uh, it, the whole content of it was being lost, deposited into the uh, intestine. The dangers of fasting are things like fibrillation, where the regular beat of the heart uh, speeds up and there is fibrillation going up to 250 beats um, a minute and so on. Uh, hemoglobin usually stays normal, tremendous loss of muscle, you have to be careful of bed sores and bony point because you have denied yourself vitamins for that period of six weeks. Then, of course, inevitably, you've got the problem of digestion. Suddenly, instead of consuming three good meals a day, you are consuming nothing. And the result is that the passage of feces is diminished and diminished and diminished and you might have to take uh, not strong but uh, appropriate appropriate um, uh, factors uh, to stop constipation. I found also, closing the subject, I found also that one's idiosyncrasies are emphasized. We all have idiosyncrasies. By that we mean we have idiosyncrasies of, di of diet, of attitude, of instinct, of health and so on. And that these tend to be emphasized when you undergo fasting. Now sooner or later the television is going to put on uh, this, this David Bain, and it'll be interesting to see uh, what, uh, what they present. Uh, I was delighted, staggered, when somebody brought me home uh, the news magazine. Uh, Time, wasn't it? Time. Time magazine, and it had on the front cover it had a girl seated in meditation, and right across it, meditation. And inside, a description of the physiological advantages of meditating. And um, one of the great factors that it proved was that the, the subject of... Um, of uh, the immune system was highlighted, that the immune system became greatly strengthened by the people who meditated. And it's wonderful to think that, that we have stood up for things like meditation for years and years and been laughed at. I remember a very famous mem member of parliament laughing at me when I was appealing to him to give a very nice person I knew an honor. Um, and he was interested in something of the background of this person, and I talked about meditation. And he sneered at meditation. He said, well, I don't have to meditate on my navel uh, to understand this or that. And uh, 
I thought back when Time magazine had this display on meditation of how hard it has been through the years to press this subject. I always love this picture. It's a picture of, well, you can take it to be whatever you like. But we are inclined to regard ourselves as fragments of the whole. The one finger is a personality talking to the other finger, but in fact both of them are joined to the hand, and the hand is part of a greater body, and it poses all sorts of questions about holism. What I don't like about people who make public efforts to meditate and to practice yoga is the fact that they are not interested basically in the most spiritual things of yoga. They're not interested in holistic concepts that everything is part of a greater whole and that they should ponder on this in their lives. They're interested in whether they can get a, a trim figure that can... Nothing wrong with that in its place, but don't call it yoga. Don't call it a process whereby uh, a man has raised himself out of slovenliness of personality into a high state. Don't call that. Um, uh, don't debase it by saying you're practicing yoga uh, just because you're trying to get a, a trimmer figure. That's not right. People need to see uh, the deeper meaning of esoteric things and dreams come under that definitely. It is suggested here by me certainly that Higher beings can reach you if you are a person that is cognizant of your dreams. And many people who would like to have higher help, like to have beings higher than man to reach them, lose that, don't get it, because they don't take into account adequately their dream life. But that also brings us to a warning about psychic self-defense. It's grievous to be confronted with the fact that the inner worlds have had to be populated just as the outer world has had to be populated. And just as there are outer world beings of inferior orders that you can't trust, so there are inner orders of beings who can't be trusted who will always grab at an energy supply. And a person who is developing spiritually is a person who is susceptible to psychic attack because they attract spiritual energies to themselves. You know what it is like when you're sitting in a public place, perhaps in a park, and everyone's having tea and things in the park, and you see somebody jogging his leg. Jog, 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 jog. Psych nervous psychic energy, you call it. Anybody else suggest what that is? Do women tend to have it? No, but men do. And you see that's some of the problem of male sexuality. 
is that the male has always the problem of excessive psychic energy to express. Not spiritual energy, psychic energy, which can go into the nervous system, or it can go into the aura, or it can go into a variety of adequate places, but often is very, very unstable. And so there are people that can be attacked in the inner worlds. And I don't want to raise this subject, but one day it will have to be faced by me. And I would be happy to join with anybody else who would give some very definite, specific indications, A, of uh, psychic parasitism and how to deal with it. How to deal with it. One of the problems that esoteric people have, of course, is they cannot stop the flow of images, of visual pictures that seem to, when they are sitting down to meditate, when they are stimulated by reading an esoteric book, that seem to want to flow out of them, one after the other. And the answer as to what you do about that is not easy because it is an indication, if you are mentally stable, it is an indication of growing spirituality, that you have the capacity to match. If something comes from the outer world, you have the capacity to match it, to match it, to match it, to match it. And it's always here in what we call the brow chakra, or the sacred square inch. And there are all kinds of important spiritual, spiritual uh, uh, angles, expressions, to be gained from this capacity to replicate yourself. That's what it is. It's replication. And if you said to me, well, Douglas Baker, you've been in the esoteric for 81 years, what can you tell us about the future of mankind? What will we be like in a million years from now, on this or on another planet? And the answer is that we will be increasingly able to replicate any experience that we've had any memory that we have, to be able to replicate it and allow it to go out into the world and to go to those planets that I described earlier. Planets E, F and G. We are building them. They are the planets that mankind will live in in the future. As the Earth dematerializes, out of its globe D into globe E and F and G, we are populating these globes in our meditation, in our anguish, in our creative ability to, to replicate. At the end of a, a long life in this field, you can be staggered by some of the things that present. I have the clearest imagery of more than a thousand faces in my life that I can recall of people that I have met or had interplay with. The ability to replicate, the ability to, to put your memory back into your childhood and examine in what I call the reading of the Akashic Records. And of course, the recall of dreams. What wonderful things they are. I always love the song from, from South Pacific. 
If you don't have a dream, how are you gonna have a dream come true? How much time left, Joe? Oh, I can do ten. Ten more minutes. Can we have some questions while I'm getting material ready? There are some mornings, though, when I know that I've had a dream, but I can't remember even the slightest detail of it to write down. And I know that the act of writing down is very helpful to me. Do you have any advice from your experience of how to help recall, especially in the first few minutes when you wake up? Almost anything can deprive you of a dream memory. Uh, if you are worried, if you are in crisis, uh, that can wipe out a dream just like that, in a, in a flash, in a second. Uh, if there is excessive desire to retain something, that can wipe it out. Um, you need some sort of device uh, which can enable you to hold the thread of the dream longer. Do you smoke? You know, what I find helpful is, is uh, a little mini cassette recorder mm -hmm. because the dreams that are potent you can be sort of in limbo and remember them. And by the time that you turn the light on and get the pen out, they're still there. But there's some that are so sensitive and so vague that, that you know as soon as you turn the light on, you're go you'll lose it. Yes. But if you've got a recorder, you don't have to open your eyes, you don't have to turn the light on. I mean, that's very true. If, you, if you've got a good tape recorder and you've had your dream and all you need to do is to put your hand out and say immediately, and it, it improves. It improves. If you persist with it, these uh, capacities will improve. I was talking a little earlier about the problem of uh, uh, people who are gushing. We call them vrittis gushing out visual images all the time. And Virginia Woolf in her books describes them beautifully. Uh, she describes how, how the thoughts of a person flow. And one of the books that I recommend is a book called The Waves by Virginia Woolf. Eventually, of course, she, she went insane and um, uh, just put weights in her pockets and walked into the river and drowned. Uh, but uh, her books are, are, are very beautiful. How do you counter this? The answer is you must deliberately sit, lie, uh, get yourself in a position whereby you can visualize something that is constantly undifferentiated, like a hedge. You've got a hedge of uh, um, evergreen, uh, fir trees, uh, cypress, whatever it is, and you see the hedge and you move along the hedge, which helps matters a bit, instead of concentrating on one cypress bush. You go along the hedge so that the mind is not getting anything else except the same picture, ongoing, uh, unbroken, continuous, and that will block, it will block any intrusion of images. Very, very useful exercise. Questions? So, yeah. Um, when you are in the state of dreaming, can you make contact with another person many, many miles away? Do you mean a higher being? No, a person that you know. A person that you know, and you can contact them in your dream life? Negative. Is it positive? Is it possible? I mean, not. Out of body, yes. If you can project yourself, if you can if you can visualize the person here, 
have a picture or, or you have developed visualizing ability, you visualize the person here, your energy will flow to that person. And if you have a message, you can try that. Or you can, uh, in astral projection, visualize the person concerned and you will go to that person. But that's a different subject. But in dreams, in dreams, I would be very, very doubtful as to whether that was, was possible. Question. Dr. Baker. Yes, sir. Um, yes. Right. Well, during one, one night, one, sometimes it, there are two or three different kinds of dreams that one can have. Some are completely confusing. Some are very logical. Um, some are almost conscious, living conscious. Um, where does one go? But there is a, there's a gap in between each one. So where does the consciousness go in between the three different types of dreams? It is perfectly true that many people can have a dream, a single dream pattern right through the night. And that it can develop as a narrative through the night. Uh, your question is, where does the consciousness go? No, the consciousness is the observer. Every one of us is an observer, and we observe part of ourself, which is a dream. And when you, when you observe and you record a dream, you're looking at part of yourself. The difference is that today, through quantum physics, we understand now that when you observe an object, you change the object that you're observing. And that's a fact. If people are watching or looking at the Mona Lisa, something passes from the person, it's called non-locality. Something passes from the person observing to what they are observing. And now this is worse, but what I'm going to tell you, but you must have it or you can't make spiritual progress. And the, the other thing then is that the Mona Lisa changes you. Observing the Mona Lisa, you change it with your mental uh, with your men mental quantum qualities, you change what you look at. And it is now shown scientifically that the object changes you. And if you have a million people observing the Mona Lisa a month or a year in Paris, that Mona Lisa is being changed by them. Not dramatically, she doesn't suddenly start to sneer or something, but there is some quality about it that is affected by observation. In science, they make sure that the factor of, a, of the scientist observing the phenomenon that he's creating, they make sure that that factor does not interfere with the experiment. I'm sorry about it, but that's modern science. And, and, and there's, uh, the application to us is obvious. If I observe something and it changes, and what I'm observing changes me, I can turn inwards and I can observe a dream or I can observe part of myself which has formed an object for meditation and I can change those things and they can change me because I'm observing them. And in all dreams, as I said last time, in all dreams, you are the observer and your dream is part of you. And you change what you see in a dream and it changes you. Now you have to take that as far as your, your spiritual awareness will allow you.
You may reject it to begin with, but those are the facts of science. Now that places an extraordinary duty on mankind. Instead of our saying, well, there is a God and we praise the Lord, we praise God, we are now saying that mankind has a special role in the universe. That mankind's role is to observe all the kingdoms of nature and to change them and they will respond and change man and that in the course of, in the course of an infinite number of years, infinite time, man will be the changer of the universe into something rich and strange and he himself in the process will be changed by what he is observing. Now that to me represents a damn sight better religion than anything I've heard on the earth. And it gives meaning to things like prayer and praising the Lord. It is an appropriate uh, it is an appropriate um, uh, observation, acceptance of things around you through the human eyes. Blavatsky was always on about it. How man, you've got it, perfectly symbolized in the silent watcher. When you tread the path, you become aware that you are being watched. You're being watched by the silent watcher. Who do we call him? What do we call him? We call him the silent watcher and we call him... Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days, the silent watcher, begins earlier than that. Sanat Kumara. That's right, thank you. Sanat Kumara, Lord of the World, the Ancient of Days, the silent watcher the inner being, Sanat Kumara being one of the Kumara families on Venus that came to the precincts of the earth 20, 30 million years ago and began to change the earth through the introduction of the Manasaputras. 